All right. Um, impulse momentum. Wow, this is weird. Uh, all right. I'm sure you everybody's about 12 to 15 feet away from me. Um, all right. So I guess maybe I should wear that visor thing, huh? For entertainment value, at least. All right. Because you can definitely take me seriously in this. Huh? momentum. It all starts with Newton's second law, right? F equals M A. I got the refills kit in, guys. I refilled them this morning. Check it out. Nice and bold. F equals M A, right? Um, and, you know, we've talked about vectors in here, so I'm going to include the vector notation here so you can kind of keep track of it. Um, so that's going to be important as we move forward. Uh, Keeping, keeping track of that if we have to use I hat, J hat, K hat notation. Um, so, acceleration, what's another way to represent acceleration if we were to make this what we call a differential equation? So if you want to take this and write it in differential, take anything that's time varying on the right side of the equation, you write it in its differential form. So what's acceleration in its differential form? What do you think? Any guesses? Close. dv dt. So differential equation, if you want to turn this into a differential equation, we write the acceleration in terms of the derivative of velocity with respect Time. You carry the vector symbol with the v, right? Which is kind of kind of interesting. M d v d t. Cool. All right. So this is now what we call a differential equation. This is now a differential equation. Um, one of the things you'll see on the AP exam is it'll say, set up the differential equation that could be used to solve for whatever, whatever it is you're looking for. So this is the differential equation that could be used to solve for the change in velocity of an object. Um, one of the standard procedures in solving for a differential equation is to write acceleration in terms of the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And then to separate the variables, which means to multiply both sides by dt. So this is kind of a weird operation because we start treating, we treat dt like a variable. Alright? We multiply both sides by dt and we bring it over there. So what we end up with is the force dt equals m v d. Alright? Now In kind of the non-differential form, we would have written uh, F equals M delta V over delta T, right? Multiply both sides by delta T, and you end up with F delta T equals M delta V, all right? If we had not treated it in differential. Well, we have kind of an interesting result here. M d v and M delta v represent the change in momentum of the object. All right, the change in momentum of the object. This would be d t differential form, this would be delta t in just regular old uh, non-differential form. That thing on the left, f dt and f delta t, that's what we call impulse. This is what we call impulse. we 
call it impulse. All right. Um, it has a symbol, capital J, you might remember. We don't really use that symbol too much. The Regents does, so you saw it last year, capital J. We don't, I didn't really even ever see that variable until uh, I went back and started teaching Regents physics. You know, we just called it impulse change in momentum. That variable isn't really used that much. We just call it delta T, right? Change in momentum. Um, now, over here, you get kind of a cool result. All right. Let's, let's take a look at this equation here, Newton's second law, kind of go back to what we had there. The idea that, let's see here, F equals M D B D T. All right. Well, we just said this equals the change in momentum D T. Right. So what you get is F equals the rate of change of momentum. F equals the derivative of momentum with respect to time. Very cool result. Very important. That is Newton's second law. All right, that's Newton's second law. F equals the derivative of momentum with respect to time. Or you could write it in non-differential form, delta P over delta T. All right, but in calculus-based physics, this is the way you typically will represent Newton's second law in upper-level upper physics. When you have something moving, you don't really pay attention to its velocity function. You either pay attention to its momentum function or its force function. And if you think about it, the momentum and the force function are simply the velocity function and the acceleration function multiplied by mass. Right? If momentum equals mass times velocity, force equals mass times acceleration. So rather than tracking an object's velocity function, you'll track its momentum function. And that encompasses its motion, you know, completely. Because the mass is going to affect the velocity, so if you track the momentum, you can figure out its velocity at any time. So that's really important. And now, over here, you'll see, you know, if we started there and separated the variables, we'd end up, um, let me go back over here. back over here, right? Board that I get from Expo cleaner here to polish these boards up. You don't use the right cleaner, they don't erase well. Alright. Um, if we say F equals DT DT, right, and we separate the variables like I just showed you. Multiply both sides, no vector over T that's ridiculous. All right, so you get F dt equals dt. This is a, how you solve a differential equation. You separate the variables, and then you take an integral of both sides. All right. Um, well, if this is just a constant force function here, let's just say it's just a generic act. No, not time variable. Well, the, the integral of f with respect to t would be force times time evaluated over an interval t1 to t2. The integral of just dp would just be t evaluated from t1 to t2. And you get f delta t equals delta t. Get back to that definition of impulse equaling change in momentum. So, to kind of summarize here, what we end up with is two things. All right, um, we're basically it's basically like dealing with velocity and acceleration functions. All right, where the um, here I'll let me draw that for you. 
where if you have a velocity function, right? Derivative, the acceleration function, but the, the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, right? So it's the acceleration of time. Well, if you have a momentum function, right? Force equals the derivative of the momentum function with respect to time. Alright, and that's kind of the new big idea here, right? This is simply the mass times this function. This is simply mass times this function. Right? The mass is what we call a scaling factor, a scalar. Scalar scaling factor, whatever however you want to say it. It simply shifts this function by a certain amount depending on how much mass there is. Now, as we know, you can go from by taking the derivative, you can move down, as we say here. You take the integral, so therefore then the integral of f with respect to time must equal a change in momentum, right? And we'll say from t1, t2. I make it a definite integral over time over time interval. So the area under the curve will give you change in momentum. The slope will give you force. Pretty cool. It's the same, it's the same math that's going from velocity to acceleration, acceleration back to velocity. Alright? So impulse momentum, it's all just an application of Newton's second law. It really is just Newton's second law playing out, so to speak. Right? Playing out in collisions and finding forces to objects and seeing how they move, right? Because often we'll know, I go back to that example of, uh, of that cigar-shaped uh, thing that flew through the solar system, right? We talked about that, I think, before. Did we go down? That might have been the other class. We went down that wormhole. Um, the other half. Where, uh, we saw this object pass through the solar system, and then when it exited our solar system, it accelerated at a rate that was not predicted. Right? We know the force, we know the force function provided by the sun on this object as it is moving, and uh, from gravity, and as it left, it didn't behave that way didn't behave as if it was only that force, so um, some people theorized the object may have been, uh, you know, some sort of alien solar sail or something like that. Who, who knows, right? Um, the one way to explain the acceleration, though, would be if it was more like a solar sail type object, something that was picking up uh, cosmic radiation and accelerating due to that as it moved away from the sun. You know, so we get we can figure out what force force function should be, right? That's the point here. To figure out what force function is. Then you gotta figure out how that causes the object to move. Well, force causes a change in momentum, and we see what happens. Now, this is why in collisions, right, momentum is conserved. This is kind of part of the next video, but you know, when two things collide, right? When two things collide, if I have a block coming in this way, a block coming in this way, when they touch each other, what must be true about that force between them? What do you think? When they hit each other here, what, what's true about that contact force? The same, the same, equal and opposite, same magnitude, right? So each of these, as they hit each other, the force that accelerates it, it back, this would be the force of two on one, this one experiences the force of one on two, those have to be the same. 
So, they both experience the same magnitude of force, right? And they must be in contact for the same amount of time, right? And they have to, you know, there's no way I can push on you for longer than you push on me. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't make sense at all. Therefore, they must both have the same magnitude of change in momentum. So anytime two objects hit, they have to have the same magnitude of change in momentum. Um, just that one of them has to be positive, one of them has to be negative. They have to be opposite directions because of Newton's third law. Every action has equal opposite reaction, right? So this one would be negative, this one would be positive. So, you know, well, momentum one gains, the other one loses, and vice versa, depending on how you think about it. Whether or not positive, negative, gain, and lose. So, this is why momentum is conserved in collisions because Newton's third law, because they experience the same amount of force for the same amount of time. They're going to have the same change in momentum, each of them, but one of them's got to be negative, one's got to be positive. So, the net change in momentum of the whole system is zero, right? Um, so, from there, we'll, we'll take a look at worksheet one here. All right.